everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Attendance Bias. I am your host, Brian Weinstein. I'm very excited to share this week's episode with you, with our guest today, Joseph of the Taste of Your Creation Instagram account. Taste of Your Creation is where Joseph, his wife, and his friends showcase different foods that they found on tour, near the venue, or on the lot. I first became aware of Joseph's account by just general fish social media osmosis, and I love the idea. I wouldn't consider myself a foodie, but I am always impressed with how resourceful fans could be on lot about cooking and finding food with fairly limited resources. Once I got in touch with Joseph, it turned out that we live quite close to one another, and so we briefly met up at a Mo show on Long Island to discuss his appearance on Attendance Bias. Once we were set with a date and a show, I was thrilled to come over to his house and record the first in-person episode of this podcast. It was a real thrill to actually speak to someone face-to-face in person. For today's episode, Joseph chose June 5th, 2009 at the Jones Beach Amphitheater. This was at the beginning of Fish's first full tour back from their breakup. June 5th was the culmination of Joseph's first full fish run, and to make it extra special, it was at his hometown venue. So let's join Joseph to talk about the best and worst food he's ever found on Fishlot, what you can and cannot sneak into MetLife Stadium, and how early 2009 fits into the 3.0 landscape as we discuss Fish's performance on June 5th, 2009 at the Jones Beach Amphitheater in Wontaw, New York. Let's meet today's guest. All right, Joseph, thank you for coming to Attendance Bias. How are you doing today? Um, excellent, Brian. Thanks for having me. My absolute pleasure. I'm really excited to talk to you about a lot today, about your Instagram account called Taste of Your Creation, about fish in early 2009, or at least early summer 2009, and of course, the show you selected, June 5th, 2009 at Jones Beach. I'm excited for a number of reasons. Number one, I love food. Number two, we grew up very near to one another, we found out. And also, only one guest so far of attendance bias. I think this is going to be like the 65th episode. Only one person has chosen a show from 2009, and his was in the winter tour. So this is new. This is a a summer 2009 show, which is kind of undervalued, I think. Yeah, I know when you you talk about like what shows uh, I should look at, early 2009, your podcast is called Attendance Bias. And I don't think people go back to listen to early 2009. And, you know, this is really early. It was my third show, the one that we're talking about. And obviously the right when Fish came back into 3.0. So, you know, maybe you say they're sloppy. They weren't where they were later in 3.0. But I go back and listen to these shows because it's where I developed a lot of my fish friendships and, you know, my first few shows. So I, I like to listen to this one. Yeah. And you could argue that's as important as the music, depending on where you are in your fandom, right? It probably didn't take long to become a jaded vet. Yeah. And I, exactly. <laughs> like I didn't know any better. Like right, my, right. my, my fish story kind of comes into a friend introducing in college, knowing there are, where they kind of eluded me where I didn't have opportunities to go see them at times. Uh, I specifically remember a two twenty eight Oh three. I was not able to go to the show cause I had college across practice. So like I might've went otherwise. So I just never got the chance. And then they didn't exist for most of my formative where I could have been touring in my early 20s, right? Yeah, well, I've told similar stories. For the Island Tour, I was in my high school drama club and our performances of Tommy, my favorite musical ever, but our performances were on April 2nd and April 3rd, 1998. It's funny you say that. Like I like I was in, I think, eighth grade in 98. Yeah, and I joked with my friends recently. I was like, oh, I, I couldn't. I was too young to go to Island Tour. And then my other friend was like, we saw corn at Nassau Coliseum that year. And I was like, all right, so I guess I could have gone to yeah. Island Tour. I just I just wasn't cool enough to know. Yeah, I was otherwise occupied, but we all have the one or the ones that got away. But let's hear a little bit more about your Instagram account, Taste of Your Creation. First off, what's the handle so people can go follow it? Uh, so on Instagram and Facebook, it is at Taste of Your Creation, the finest in the nation. So just at Taste of Your Creation. And I guess basically in, in a... In a rundown, it's me eating food, but uh, it's a it's a it's a lot more than that. So years ago, uh, particularly on Jones Beach lot, friends and I uh, would you know walk around lot, eat food, and record each other talking about it. Uh, so that now it's really morphed into something that's an opportunity to talk to people on lot about 
you know, what they're cooking at vendors. It's an opportunity to kind of go and get recommendations of when you're on tour, what to travel, what to eat, what to suggest to other people. And of course, dinner and movie was a big thing in the pandemic. So my wife made every dinner and a movie recipe because she's a wonderful cook and she's really the brains behind the operation here. Well, you're just the talent. Yeah, I'm the talent. I'm, I'm the, the eye face. candy. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I don't think I'm eye candy is the word. I have a face for radio. But uh, it's a way to positively spread stuff about food. And really with the dinner and the movie with my wife, she made the first recipe and then she made like the first couple. And then she was like, oh, so this is a thing we do now? Yeah, well, it became a thing we did in our yeah. apartment. My favorite of the dinner and a movie recipes was the curry that Paige selected. Yes. you know what It you... was the easiest one. Well, one of the easiest ones to make too, once you found the curry uh, powder. Paige, Paige had all the easiest of the recipes. Sandwiches, and, and yeah. The sandwiches, the, 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 the tacos, the tuna, you know, the tuna melt, you know, a hamburger and literally any bag of chips. And it's funny when you, <laughs> when we talk about our favorite recipes, we had a lot of people come over at that time, outside barbecues and stuff like that, that, uh, the curry is always my friends say like one of the best ones that my wife, that Melissa, my wife made. Um, another one of our favorites, and this is, uh, was the, the meatballs, mm -hmm. the lamb meatballs. So I actually convinced her to make a tray of meatballs and a tray of spatacopia. And our friends played on a balcony here in Long Beach and they, uh, covered shade. They played like, you know, live music early in the pandemic. And that's actually when I proposed to her. So it was oh, uh, nice story. A, a little, uh, tidbit of info there. Uh, also, I noticed on your Instagram account that, Every Sunday you're at a Giants game, or nearly every Sunday. And I don't know if this is the time and place to talk about a Giants season, especially this season. But what I've noticed is my favorite ones of your of your uh, posts are the ones where you're able to say what you can bring into the stadium and what you can't bring into the stadium. How does that work? I've had season tickets to the Giants since the mid-90s. There was actually a streak where um, I didn't miss a Giants home game for maybe 15 years. Uh, I've seen every snap Eli Manning took at home uh, for for the Giants. So I'm a big Giants fan. It's a thing we do with our family. So yeah, talking about the Giants is kind of sucky when they suck. It's great when yeah. they're great. That's sports, right? But, uh, you know, the tailgate and going there with our family is much more than that. So the 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 bag bit. Uh, yeah, you can bring what is that? anything into a, in a Ziploc bag into a Giants <laughs> game. Uh, and I mean anything of you they don't really they don't really check like when you're a season ticket holder they give you a clear plastic bag to bring in and now that's popular at fish shows right right you have to go i've been used to that for a while so i have clear plastic bags my sister has clear plastic pocketbooks that she brings into games and they really don't look in it um you know maybe i shouldn't be saying this out loud i won't say some of the <laughs> yeah, things it's i've brought get back in. to, uh, to uh, the my, family, my yeah. father's definitely brought in cigars and cigar cutters because you can smoke cigars in the stadium really you could sm you, you're allowed to smoke outside on the concourse like yeah I know like, that. like you know where you first walk in before you go into the stadium so he just puts his if he put a cigar cutter in his pocket they wouldn't let it through. He puts it in the bag with the food. It doesn't matter. So, you know, we've put white claws in there, you know, things like that, because they just don't look. But you're actually able to bring anything in a Ziploc bag that's food related. Um, so, you know, there is ways to sneak liquor if you want to do that. But uh, we've been doing, you know, po pasta bags, uh, <laughs> you know, meatballs, obviously. We did uh, Sloppy Joe recently. And uh, we have there's a game coming up in a couple weeks. We're gonna do uh, tacos in a bag, so we call it the walking taco. Uh, what that is is basically. <laughs> what do you do with the shells? Uh, so you get a bag of like Doritos or something like that, oh. and put the put like put the meat in a Tupperware, put the meat in that bag, and then you have a walking taco. So you use like you know like the the individual size, like a Frito Lay. Yeah, yeah. Or hey, you want to do Cheetos? Who gives right. a shit, right? Like. Right, you go to Costco and get the snack bag. Exactly. Yeah. And then, so it's kind of like a breakdown. First, pick your snack bag, then pick your tacos. Now you have your walking taco. Wow, well, you're just like Moe's over here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I Two that caught my attention of the foods that you've posted. One was the fried ramen, which sounds and looked incredible. And my understanding was just a ball of ramen with just dough fried around it that you cut into almost like it's a chicken cordon bleu. Uh, exactly. Uh, that was inspired by my my wife, again, the brains of the operation. Yeah. I can't say that enough, right? She follows, obviously, lots of other chefs and things like that. Uh, the vulgar chef on Instagram basically does, like, things that would repulse people, like, and eats it and cooks it and puts way too much ketchup on things. <laughs> so he showed, hey, you take a cup of noodles, you know, 
uh, cook it, strain the water, then put, you know, wrap, you know, egg wash that and fry it in dough, you know, wrap in dough, then deep fry it. And then, yeah, you have a deep fried cup of ramen, um, you know, looks at, maintains that cylinder shape and then, you know, sauce to perfection, you know, whatever <laughs> sauces you want to do that. So that, that was, that was a fun one recently. And the other one that caught my attention, which you called the best breakfast ever, and I would have eaten it on the spot. Was the it eggs. was a poached egg yeah. in what I forget? So it's eggs in purgatory, uh, <laughs> right? So that's that's a poached eggs and a fra diavolo sauce. So it's slightly spicy. Um, you literally just make a watery type spicy fra diavolo sauce and poach the egg inside of that. Put it on a little baguette, you know, or whatever, whatever you want to say, toasted toasted crostini, a little garlic and cheese. Uh, it's my favorite thing, and we. We do eat that at Giants games always. I'm not sure if I could bring that in a bag. And I just don't think it <laughs> I don't would know hold, if you should. I don't think it would hold up. Yeah. 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 So it's your version of egg in a hole. Yes. You might say. <laughs> you get most of your food in your posts from walking around on lot and finding vendors. What was the worst food you've ever had on lot? And you are encouraged to name names for this one. What's the best food you've ever had on lot? Absolutely no, no questions asked. This donut grilled cheese. And it's from Hampton 2018. I'm fairly positive about everything I eat. Like their their dinner and movie recipes I might not like as much. The visceral reaction you see in my face when I take a <laughs> bite of that donut grilled cheese. Like, like why would you you like ruin two good things? Like I thought it was gross. <laughs> So if you are the vendor or any vendor that thinks that's a good idea because grilled cheese is popular and donuts is popular and fish, stop it. Yeah, too much of a good thing. Yes. Uh, and then so the best, and I will say this was a suggestion from Frames, et cetera. When we were going to Dick's in 2019, I've eaten lots of great stuff, you know. It was a pesto mozzadilla that was all on tour this year. And it's funny, we, we we got a couple of them. And, you know, I'm not the only person eating. We're always with a crew of friends. And, like, you saw everyone that, that took a bite of it as we passed it around or had their own whatever. And they, they place always had a line. Like, it was really flavorful. Unfortunately, a lot of lot food sometimes is underwhelming like oh yeah it, it's, it's there for sustenance yes, right? exactly it's there for sustenance that was something that was excellent so i don't know who made that they were on tour all summer and i will have my eye out for them again at nashville this year we had a texas toast grilled cheese the the guy's name was paul i know that that made it <laughs> uh it was macaroni and cheese grilled cheese uh and like even though you know we, we got COVID in Nashville and maybe that was the culprit. I would eat that grilled cheese again. <laughs> Hashtag so worth it. It was that good. <laughs> I remember in 2016, I was at the Gorge with my girlfriend and we ended up camping next to a group of guys, probably about four of them, maybe five, that were all professional chefs. One guy had, um, I think it was a fork and a knife crossed as a tattoo on his back across his shoulder blades. And all weekend we were eating like kings. It was, we, it was the most fortunate thing ever. We were sleeping after the first night. It was only a two-night run. We were sleeping after the first night and maybe like 3.30 a.m. estimate. We don't really know what time it was. They were on acid all weekend. And we hear like, you know, the clinking and clanking of pans and cutlery and cooking utensils. And I hear one guy mumble to the other, yeah, what is that? What, what are you doing? He goes, oh, this? Nothing. It's just some elephant ear garlic. And then it's... <laughs> Like I woke up by four because it smelled so good. So the the idea of like first being able to cook and eat on acid is a skill in itself. Yeah, they were pros. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I may have the eating part down. The gorge, right? So yeah. it's not just about when you go to the lot and eat of what people are vending. It is about, and just as fish in general, eating food that people next to you are cooking so actually in the Gorge 2018, we found a guy making lamb sandwiches and he was just like in the, it, he like posted on some Facebook group, hey, I'm making sandwiches, find me, I'm in Premiere, I'm not really vending, but if you find me, you know, I'll hook you up. And we walked around yelling, sandwiches, sandwiches, <laughs> And then it turned out like, you know, he was a professional butcher and, and a chef at a restaurant in Denver that he actually bought the meat from a, a butcher shop that my buddy worked at that I was with. And then you start getting that like, you know, only at fish, only at fish, that stuff's happened. So if you are looking for good food, not just what's being sold on lot, talk to people that are just yeah. tailgating, talk to people that you're camping near. I will say with all due respect to those guys, I don't remember what you were cooking with elephant ear garlic, but the next day before the show, my girlfriend and I went to like the, the common area where all the, the official vendors were. 
And I wanted, I always like to eat big before a show because I, I never want to feel like the beginning of the second set, like I can't stand anymore. And so I was like looking for a burger, something simple and digestible. My girlfriend is hanging back at the campsite, said she'll meet me. She comes up to meet me with a gigantic, like handful of foil and just, Hey, Hey, I forget the name, but like those guys next to us, they here, they wanted here, get, take this. She could barely get a sentence out. So I grabbed it. I'm like, what is this? They were cooking sockeye salmon sandwiches. And said, yo, you got to give this to Brian. Like in 24 hours, we made best friends. And now we were eating like at a five-star or three-star Michelin rated restaurant hunt. That's really funny. Uh, Things not to eat before a show. I would always say, I always try to avoid fish or, but you know, if it's like a salmon cake, something. Um, I've got friends that have stories of eating lot sushi and getting sick. Oh, and I just no. think that's a bad idea. Avoid, see, avoid seafood. Yeah. I saw a girl at one of the Baker's Dozen shows. She got sushi from the vendor inside the garden, right? Which is fine. You know, yeah. the, the garden has good food. All Half price before half price 6.30. Before six, yeah. that, that is the move. If you don't know that, the lobster roll is phenomenal. And it's like $12 before 6.30, which, right. is, which is good. So she ate half of it. She put it under a seat. And then pulled it out during set break. I was like, that you don't do. Yeah, that's somewhere between genius and insanity. Yes. There's a thin line. But talking about experiences at shows, let's go into the attendance bias lightning round so we can hear about your background and who you are as a fan. Attendance bias lightning round. So, Joe, what was your first fish show? Uh, so the Tuesday night, 6 2 2009 So the Tuesday night of Jones Beach, that uh, early summer tour. Okay, so just a couple before the one we're discussing. A couple today. before the one we're discussing. And what was your most recent show? Uh, the Sunday night show, 9 5 2021 Dix. Overall, all else being equal, what's your favorite song? Fluffhead. It gives me chills at the peak, no matter how many times I listen to it in the car or see it live. Are there any particular versions that really grab you? Uh, the Baker's Dozen version is, is a favorite of mine. SPAC 2019, if I go back, what year was that? Where it was Steam? 2011. 2011, so that one. And it's because I was at those shows, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you're on the right podcast. Yeah. What's your favorite indoor venue and then your favorite outdoor venue? Uh, indoor MSG. I think you said before, the, I've seen the majority of my shows there, like being a New Yorker. Right? Yeah, yeah, like mine too. Over of half shows. of mine yeah. are, yeah. Uh, outdoors, The Gorge. Any songs that you're chasing right now? Uh, my theory about this is you're, you could be chasing songs and I could say a song. I'm going to say, I want to see vultures. So I've never seen it. I'm chasing vultures. That's what it is. My favorite part about fish or one of them, you know, you say one of the favorite parts, how many can you have? Yeah. Is you don't know what you're chasing. Like That's a good point. There's songs that they're going to play that you didn't realize you wanted to see that or you know about it and you're, you're just destined like, oh, they're never going to play that again. So it's that. And then you're at a show and they play it. So it's. The song, like this is like when they played Access Me and Dicks a couple years ago. Like, I know that song. I like that song. You know, my wife getting into the fish. Like, I didn't give her that song because I was like, she's never going to see this live. So she, she doesn't need to know this song. Oh, they play it. Oh, man, that's great. That's that's great. So don't be aware of the songs that you don't know you're chasing. Well, yeah, that's a really good point. I think it was December 30th, 2018. I'll have to check that in the fact check. But when they played Mike's Into Glide 2. Exactly. I had no idea. Exactly. Exactly that. Like you, you don't know what's going to happen. If you know it, that's even better. Sometimes you don't know it's a song that you you want to see. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, that was that was great. But yeah, you never expect to see that type of song. Any songs that are chasing you? Uh, definitely chalk dust torture. You know, like most fish nerds, I like looking at my stats. That's oh, me one, too. Yeah. That's the one I've seen the most. And I think you're the man to ask this question. I ask everyone this: What is your favorite post show snack? Uh, so my friends will say I go full send at shows with dancing and stuff like that. So you'd be surprised. Like I don't really eat often after shows. Um, I'm like, sometimes I can barely talk or stand, but you know, there's different, different reasons. Uh, but I'll answer you easy way. Uh, bottles of water, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. What the fuck is just bottles of water and most likely a meat stick because, uh, my wife has them in her purse. Oh, killer. <laughs> that, yeah. That 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 would be that would be my my go-to. It's hard for me to sometimes get things after shows on lot and things like that. And uh, I just I tend not to eat. Maybe I ate too much before. <laughs> it's that's crazy. To me it's crazy because I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat after the show before I leave. 
to yeah. go to it. I got to plan ahead. I, I remember one time, I think it was 2010 or 2012. I think it was 2010 when they played Jones Beach, actually. It was August. And my friend Adam came with me. After the show, we went straight to the Wonton Diner. Because it's like literally <laughs> a straight road from Jones Beach to the Wonton Parkway onto Sunrise <laughs> Highway in Wonton. At, at the time of these Jones Beach shows, I lived on Park Avenue across the street from the Wonton Diner. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah, so I, I was perfect. probably, we, we might have went there too. Very well, yeah. yeah. And he was in the back seat. He didn't say a word. <laughs> and he was like you, where you said like he barely speaks. He was splayed out in the back seat. He was speechless. And all I could think about is I want my eggs and I want my mozzarella sticks and cheese fries. And that's my priority. That's the classic late night going totally. to any diner, right? Your disco fries. Yeah, totally. And last question, which is my favorite of the lightning round. What is the weirdest thing you've ever seen at a fish show? I think that uh, that that sushi girl, that was the, the most uncomfortable thing. In a, in a world of spinners and glitter and people wearing capes and doing whatever you want, watching someone eat hour and 45 minute old sushi that was sitting under their chair is the weirdest, most uncomfortable thing I've seen. Yeah. I don't even like drinking a water bottle that didn't have a cap on it. Yes. At, at a fish show. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. But yeah, it's, it's also, I, I like that question because it's in a world of weird, maybe like a normal thing would be like the weirdest thing you see in like, Oh, just like a regular guy being like, Oh, what time is this? Is this intermission? <laughs> oh, this band actually sells merchandise. Like, like, I, I don't know. Yeah. When was this show played? Before we dive into this show, let's talk about fish in early 2009. We started a little earlier, but I think there's a lot to be said for this era that is unheralded and largely ignored. So today's show, June 5th, 2009, was played at the very beginning of Fish's first full-scale tour of 3.0. They had played the three comeback shows at Hampton in March, but this was the first week of their first summer tour. Um, it was dubbed the, quote, early summer tour, which ran from March, I'm sorry, May 31st at Fenway, and ended June 21st at Alpine Valley. Later in the summer, there was the late summer tour appropriately and that went from july 30th at red rocks and then ended at august 16th at spac and this show today the 5th of june was the third of three shows at jones beach now my memory is the band announced both tours at the same time early and late but they added the fenway show on um, may 31st and then the tuesday jones beach show which was june 2nd a couple days later at the last minute and uh, tickets were there for the taking for both of them. I remember um, I remember the late edition of the Jones Beach show. And I remember leave, that was my first show that Tuesday night, right? Okay, yeah. Um, so the when you left and you listen to the recording back, and this is like that, and I've had friends mention this before too, um, Trey goes, well, we'll see you Thursday because you apparently all have plans tomorrow night. Like, So maybe there was another concert that Wednesday at Jones Beach planned. There must have been, or, you know, they, it became very apparent early on in 3.0 that some of the rules of tour were different now that they're, I think Paige said they're only going to play 50 shows or fewer in a given calendar year, uh, that they'll never play more than three shows in a row, except for something like the new year's run. So maybe they just needed that night off with travel between Fenway to Jones beach and then two days in a row. And then they played the next night after Jones Beach, I think it was June 6th at Great Woods. Yeah, I would do, uh, I know you do your fact check stuff. Yeah, yeah. I would take a look at the Jones Beach schedule and see if something was there. I will. I will. I'll see. So I was at all three of these Jones Beach shows, as were you. Uh, I had recently moved to Oceanside, which we are like right next to right now. And I grew up pretty close in a town called Merrick. And to me, I have a feeling you would feel the same, that Jones Beach was my summer hometown venue whereas the Nassau Coliseum was more of my year-round hometown venue. I saw fewer concerts at the Coliseum because there were fewer concerts at the Coliseum. But Jones Beach was like my hometown venue, and I have mixed feelings about it. On a nice night, it's the best venue to ever see any band ever. But on a windy night or a rainy night, it's hell. And it rained this whole week almost. Everyone everyone talks about like, oh, Jones Beach 2012. Oh, it rained so much. 2013. 2013, whatever, yeah. That, yeah, whatever that one was. I think it rained more on that Friday night we're talking about in 2009. Maybe collectively. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> yeah, like all three days. Um, yeah. But same thing. So at the time I lived in Wantaw, which is 
you know, it's the same town, same town, just not on the beach, you know, uh, eight miles up. I'm from Long Island uh, in South Shore. So going to Jones Beach, I saw like my first concerts there, which I think was the Cranberries. Hey, and, like, not yeah, right? bad. So it's fitting that I saw my first fish concert at Jones Beach. Uh, but again, yeah, countless, countless shows there. And one of the most beautiful venues, one of the worst venues in the world. Yeah, like, they could be both at the same time. At the same time. Yeah. One of my first concerts was also at Jones Beach. I saw Jethro Tull with my dad with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer opening up. It that's was a definitely, good show. That's definitely like a standard Jones Beach uh, yeah. schedule. Like I think Jethro Tull still does a, a show of something. Totally. There, definitely. It's also a very dad show. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> and so, all right. At the time in 2009 that this show was played, Fish hadn't played Jones Beach in 14 years. Their last show was there on also in June, but June 29th, 1995. During the years in between, they added that red upper mezzanine, which I hate. And I was all in for this run. I was, I had a full-time job, like year-round salaried full-time job for the first time. I was off in the summers, although this is not quite yet summer for Long Island and New York State teachers. I had friends coming into town. I had a pre-party at my apartment. We left early for the lot, even though the weather was miserable. All three nights, but I was thrilled no matter what. It just sucked that it rained. But it was clear in retrospect that the band was just getting their sound together. Like, they were just kind of getting their sea legs back, you know, at Jones Beach. And I remember the excitement of hearing songs at the show that hadn't been played since even before the high, uh, before 2.0. Like, there were songs like Timber Ho, Cities, If I Could, Buried Alive. Those, I think some of those were played in 2.0, but it felt like it had been forever. So like I, I mentioned earlier, like Fish eluded me for years. Um, they were broken up for most of my college years. So I was seeing other bands and things like that. They're always something that like I listened to and had friends like show like show me and bring it in. So like I, I knew I wanted wanted to go. So like I knew I had to be at these three shows. I was also a first year teacher. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think teachers like summer tours for teachers. It's made right? for us. It's yeah. made for teachers. So that that's like something I knew. I had friends coming in from out of town. Um, I remember driving straight from the school I worked with, which was on the North Shore, to the lot to meet my friends there. It was like all my friends from college, like not not just like Long Island friends, but friends from out of town that came in. And, you know, that's still the crew that I, I go to fish shows with and that I talk to on a daily basis. What were your memories of this show and your impressions? Was it your first show and that or your first three shows at these Jones Beach shows that it was like, they can do no wrong? Were you in your honeymoon period? Oh, de- like, definitely. Like, you yeah. know, so, so yeah. you know, again, talking about like, you know, attendance bias for sure. Like, I didn't know any better. So hearing every, like, even though like, I got listened, and I listened to shows and I, like, I remember dropping my friends off at, uh, at the airport to go, to go to a, a New Year's run, like er- early on when we were in college, I might have, actually, that might have been after this. But I remember like not being able to go to to uh, Coventry and stuff because I was on a family vacation. Like, and I so I would have gone to fish earlier. So whatever they played was gonna be good, and like I knew a good amount, but I also didn't know at all. So like in going to the shows, like it was it palatable in the air, excitement. Like the weather did not matter. And I, yeah. if I recall correctly, while it was like rainy on lot and with like rain here and there, like the better weather when you were on lot. And it poured during the shows. So you had a little bit of that Jones Beach, that beach feel. And just like leading up to the shows too, at the time, Matt Pinfield was on 101.9. And I, I know that he talked about the shows and he might have like played some songs off Joy that came out later in the year. Like, really? I, and like, I, I remember him talking about the shows and, and it's like maybe in my brain, like uh, it made up that he also played <laughs> yeah. a song or two, which is probably more likely. But he 100 percent was like the return, the fish returned to, to Long Island and and to playing shows so like that was cool. And like that was like, you know, Matt Pinfield was like the DJ in New York. Oh, yeah. And he was, you know, obviously yeah. the MTV guy for so long, too. So that that like solidified and justified like oh like this is a band that i think it's I'm legit gonna, yeah like, this is a band i'm gonna go see i've always been hearing about it i've listened to them i'm into other jam bands so like that that was uh it was exciting to be there and of all the shows you've ever seen all the jams you've ever witnessed and even from these three shows why did you pick this show um so like you know it's something that i listen back to it and you kind of summed it up earlier on like it's not something that uh it's it's not a 
time era that people go and listen back to because it's like oh like they weren't they didn't have their sea legs they weren't hitting their stride they didn't have the same sound as late in 3.0 it was obviously not 1.0 like it's so it, it's what I, I when i kind of go through different shows that you talk about with you with the you know your guests it's something it's an era that people don't talk about um you know it was but it's also like the the we're just happy to be here set one so set one opens with Wilson. And since a live one, to me, this has been established as the opener, best opener in the catalog. Just because I get to pretend I'm part of the opening of disc one. And it really got things going from right away. And as we'll hear, the sound quality from the recording that's on Fish.in isn't that great. But when they get to that, can you still have fun line? I mean, people in the audience have been waiting to shout that for what, five years at this point? It was such a good opener. So there was that moment in college where like my friends that were going to fish shows, like while it was like between 2.0 and 3.0 would be like, oh, like fish isn't just about you. It's audience participation. Yeah. And like Wilson is the epitome of that from the opening note. Right. So that, that chant, the Wilson chant. So I was really excited to see that for the first time because I that was one of the ones I knew going into that week. Following that, it's really interesting. The first two are Wilson and Buried Alive. So it's it's like back to back openers. I know not technically that can't be true, but like I mentioned, one of the big joys of early summer tour of 2009 was whenever the band would play an old song and it would be, oh, this is the first version of Buried Alive since whatever. And it was played in Vegas 2004, Buried Alive was, but I think that whole run is best forgotten. So, uh, and I think now, like, you have that, the trope of when a show opens with Buried Alive, it's a fire show. Like, that's yeah. what people will say. I don't know if that's the same if it's the second song. I'll count it. Right? We'll, we'll count it. And, like, yeah. so this is a, this is one of the shows that gets a Buried Alive to open with it. And while it might not be the most fire recognizable song, you know, show from that, from overall, you know, I think there's a lot of really good points. So it's Buried Alive set the tone. Yeah, well, I'll say when I go through the file cabinet of my brain, of my fish memories, when I think about this show, I remember Buried Alive, but I don't remember Wilson. Ah. So it struck me, for sure. Up next is Kill Devil Falls, which interestingly is a repeat from the show they played Tuesday. It debuted there. And we know now Fish doesn't repeat, or any longer, they don't repeat two songs in a run at the same venue. But I guess they were just really excited to play it, and maybe Tuesday was just a one-off show anyway, because it was... Before then, unscheduled. And there was a day between, so maybe it doesn't oh, count right. as the same Everyone run. had to go home. Everyone yeah. was busy. Everyone was busy. What plans did you have that Wednesday? Yeah. Do you uh, remember your reaction to Kill Devil Falls? Because it was, for all intents and purposes, a brand new song. Yeah, so I guess, you know, this is the first Fish song I saw twice. Oh, the right? first repeat. So huh? it's the first repeat I ever, right away. I ever saw. <laughs> uh, the question I, I would come back back on is... I mean, I, I really enjoy that song now. It's definitely not, wasn't, like, when you listen back to this version, it isn't to me then what it is now. Of course, um, yeah. You know, because it's the, song, the first song I saw twice, and I knew that, because I remember leaving that night. I was like, oh, they played that on Tuesday night as well. Um, when was the last time Fish did to a song repeated in the same run? That, that's a, that's a, that's something know. to think to think back to, right? So like maybe not this counting is it. teases or quotes, not or counting callbacks. teases or co quotes or reprises. Like right. when was the last time they played two nights or three nights or four nights somewhere and played at the song standalone twice in that run? This might be the answer. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I would guess it's probably at 1.0. I I wouldn't be surprised if it was like as far back as 95 or 96 yeah. when they were playing different time zones in di consecutive days. So this could be a trivia. The, la the, the last time is good trivia for the nerds out there. Zizix, right? if you're hearing us right now, I'm counting on you, bro. <laughs> well, first of all, before we just jump off Kill Devil Falls, something I remember from it too is 
it was hard to wrap my mind around the lyrics because the lyrics, I think Trey has said since that it's a song about uh, to describe addiction. You know, this time will be different until I do it again and relapse that that aspect of addiction, promising you'll get better. But your promises don't have that much credibility because you're not in control. And I, I don't know if those are his words, but that's kind of what he said around that. And I remember hearing that these are very kind of uncertain and dark lyrics. And it didn't quite jibe with me, even though the song is very upbeat. I remember some fans calling it Fish's Alabama Getaway pretty quickly off the bat. Did you have any sense of that? Or is it because you were a new fan, you just took everything for granted? So I definitely just took everything for granted. You want yeah. to look at, look back at hindsight. A few songs off Joy, like, sound super positive, but do have those dark undertones. Oh, very much. A lot so of 3.0. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of 3.0 in general, but definitely, like, songs off Joy. Like, uh, 20 years later, you know, the song Joy itself. Like, even Number Line, like, Number Line's the ultimate positive song, I think. But, like, it goes back to a nostalgia period. Like, and that makes a lot of people sad. Yeah. ACDC bag, which is like, we, we've gotten three or four openers in a row now. And then they, they kind of goof off a little bit with I Didn't Know, which I do have a very sharp memory of them all walking to the front of the stage. And I don't think I'd heard this one since Cincinnati 2003. So again, my brain keeps going back to, oh my God, I haven't heard this in... Six years. This is so exciting. Meanwhile, for four and a half, they weren't even playing it. Yeah. I mean, again, like this is the the quote unquote antics that I was yeah. always told the bad fish. Right. Um, and now like thinking about like this guy's playing a vacuum. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, and kind of what we th- how I think about the vacuum now or my, my, my buddy, as, as mentioned before, is like, whose job is it to tune the vacuum? Is the vacuum always tuned when they're about to use it? And why do I see a band that makes me question the vacuum needing to be tuned? There are crazier questions <laughs> to ask about fish. Now, let me ask you, did you ever did you watch video of them? Had you like seen them before you came to your first show? Yeah. So we, 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 uh, we definitely watched some videos in college. Uh, um, I don't think I've, I don't think I streamed any shows, but I, I know, I remember, um, like there was some two point, some two point two two point oh shows that, you know, that my buddy would get it on tape or something. Yeah. And then we would watch in the dorm room. Um, it's like basically like my group of friends in college that I see shows with now. And at the time, like they were all in much earlier, so it was like normal for someone. Hey, we got this tape. We're gonna watch yeah. this or this DVD or recording, or whatever it is, or probably a hard drive because it was that weird time in technology when you were going from analog to digital. Yeah, like you didn't have wireless internet in your you didn't have wireless internet in Ethernet, your dorm room, bro. But you could plug in and then grab any music off someone else's right, file computer share, yeah. inside the dorm. So things like that. Right. And you had maybe a gig of storage. Yeah. So I, I knew things like I've seen, I've seen videos of jumping on trampolines. I've seen videos of the vacuum. So the antics, I just never like saw it in life. Yeah. And it is different. It's really fun when it happens. Coming up next was my friend, my friend, which was, I wrote characteristic chaos. It's, the best at what it does and it's super fun and exciting even though it's predictable it's one of those things that is predictable yet never loses its thrill this is one of my favorite songs this is probably my favorite version of that song because attendance buys yeah, this is course. like when i i go back to listen to this segue this segment of the show or organized chaos which is cool um i always think my friend my friend is like the light and the dark um, the very fir- much the yeah. first part of that or- orchestrated part very upbeat positive like that and then it gets like scary and you know depending where you're at or frame of mind that song may make you leave I'm relating very heavily to what you're saying right now and how you describe the it. Light, the light and the dark. Yeah. And then that's, that's, that's what I think what a lot of fish is, right? Oh, yeah. It's, you can't have one without the other. Yamar comes in next, which is usually the best feel-good summer song. I picture 
being at uh, a, a summer shed, like whether it's Camden or Great Woods, I picture Yamar being like a very boppy dance around, usually when the sun is out. I don't know why. I know that's not technically true, but it's usually a very lovely song. But it was raining and it was a little weird. Yet Mike comes through with a really awesome bass solo about five and a half minutes in. And even when I was re-listening to the show, I had to keep rewinding it. Yeah, this, this part of the this part of the show, it is definitely pouring. Yeah. Um, and I, I I specifically remember it. And when I go back to the recording listening as well, the bass line's really good. The the, the bass solo. Yeah. And it comes with the Mike play it for your grandpa. Yeah, it's which Mike's is, grandpa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know the classic tray now you know i want to hear mike play in the bass one of the things that mike says before he gives it off to one of the members to go crazy theme from the bottom is next which is very enjoyable i this was played at my first show so i always have this sentimental connection to theme from the bottom and my note here i my thought when i was listening is that it's really enjoyable this set so far we're a little more than halfway through it i think by time time wise it's really fun to hear, but it's really interesting to look back and see how they've really mastered the flow of the set list in 2021 compared to where they were in 2009, which really is putting your iPod on random. This seems to be. Just play songs to play songs. Yeah. So funny, you said, like, I didn't know it was your fir the first, you heard this at your first show. Yeah. I always had a theory about this song that if you bring someone to their first show, they're going to get this song. And it's specifically that one line, like, don't you feel anything you'd like to try? Yeah, right. Yeah. So it, it's it's something that I, I've had a number of people I've brought to their first show that this is this has been this is played. And I was like, oh, like this, of course, because that maybe that's a chasing first show type song. Well, does does that imply that if they don't play it, that everyone at the show has been there before? Possibly. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that I think that's very possible. Getting toward the end of the set, they follow up with Boogie on Reggae Woman, which is always a fun funk, you know, a jolt of pretty fun party funk. It really comes together about five minutes, but for all intents and purposes, I was getting ready to go to the bathroom and beat the set break rush, you know, get something to drink during Boogie on. They played Split Open and Melt, which I think has had kind of a rough go in 3.0 with exceptions, with some very positive versions. But I think it's had a generally difficult run because it's very hit or miss. And one of my guests, uh, Justin Bruce, has mentioned that they often call on split open and melt toward the end of a set. To His words were to make hay, like to kind of save a set that didn't have a lot of jams. And I don't think they were there yet, but I don't know if they've still figured out split open and melt since like the late 90s. Split open and melt by far, as far as songs that I see live, has the best batting average of huh. I have no idea what's happening right now. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> like like the the what song are they playing? Oh, this one. Like like I've been uncomfortable in that. Like and I love the weird noise, uncomfortable in the jam. Like that's my favorite fish. Um but split open and melt does that to me almost every time. And I would say I'm good at being like, oh they're in this jam still and I know what's happening. Most of the time, if I'm in a split open and jam melt, maybe I definitely happened at this because it's my third show. I was definitely there. Like, I have no idea what's happening right now. And sometimes that's great. Yeah, it's a good That's feeling. great. They played it at uh, Atlantic City this past summer. It was one of my favorite versions in years. But it still had that kind of, I don't know. I think there's a thin line between psychedelic and meandering. Like, I lose all the threads. And I just, I don't know where to center myself because I need a little bit of land. 
Yeah, and I don't think this version does, does like it definitely did it to me because I was the first time there. It doesn't do that if you listen back where it completely goes off where you're like, No, it is, doesn't. Is this music? Right. But that's what no. that song like, you know, it's just like, oh, what fish sounds like to fish fans that don't like fish. Like part of it, split yeah. open and melt is that song. Yeah. Set two. And set two opens with Down with Disease. The Again, I have a, another sentimental connection because the second set of my first show opened with set Down with Disease. And it was a perfect way to open any set. My favorite part of this Down with Disease, like you mentioned way earlier, that a lot of 2009 is songs don't go past 10 minutes for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. And this Down with Disease, I think, clocks in at 10 minutes and 34 seconds. But it heralded back for me to closer to the song's debut in the mid-90s, like 94, 95, where it was just after the song itself, which is about three and a half minutes long or four, the remaining six minutes is just straight energy, fire, and major key feel good rock and roll jamming. This one kind of brought me back to those tapes when I was learning about Down with Disease. Yeah, this this is a good this is a good song to listen to at the show. I mean, it's straightforward Down with Disease, right? Consistence in life, death, taxes, and second set opener <laughs> Down with Disease. Towards the end of this, before they go into the next song, they have like these weird space noises, which I think is like how you would define fish now. Like or, toward the end, you yeah, mean, towards uh, the end, yeah. like literally the last minute of it. And I love me some good weird space noises. So like. It's good to see that Fish is doing that in 2009 and potentially in 4680. Before starting up with Twist, and it's that perfect fuzzy in between what song are they going into until it's brought in from the dissonance. And I, at the time, I remember this being the jam of the show. This I have very clear memories of. And I think what is most well known for and what people remember most about it is that they do a full on quote of Oye Como Va. Which is super fun because Twist, after the lyrics, it's basically Oye Como Va anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, so it's definitely a, like, if you listen back to it, I think it's a, 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 I enjoyed the seg that they do between Down with Disease and Twist. And leaving that show, I probably was like, oh, they played Santana. Like, I definitely, yeah, like, I probably did. said that, yeah. like, because they did. Like, it's like a minute and a half, two minutes of they played o o Oye Como Va. So.
uh, yeah, I know that, um, you know, they opened for Santana and stuff. So that was a cool thing. I, I knew that at the time. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think I've seen a twist that I like, kind of like will decide I want to go listen back to uh, like this one. Oh, I have some recommendations yeah. for you. I would, I'll take them. I'll yeah. take them. I just, you know, thinking of shows I've been at, it's not one that I think to put on. I was so excited about this. When you just mentioned that they opened for Santana, I think at Jones Beach, one of those dates, and I think it was 1992. My excitement for this comeback tour, I was ready for them. I expected fish to be every type of fish that I loved throughout all of 1 and 2.0. I just show up in 2009. Obviously, that's not how life and music and people work. But I was just so overwhelmed and so excited. That's the mindset that I was going in unfairly to the band. That when they started teasing and playing Oye Como Va, I said, Oh my God, they, they played Jones Beach once, however many years ago, to open for Santana. This must be a nod to that. They're obviously aware of it. Not that, that it sort of sounds like it anyway. That's like such a fish fan for you thing to yes, say. Yeah, like, I'm a big like, nerd. Everything's connected. Where it might have just been like, hey, they did it. Who cares? We're in the back of the mind. Like, it's probably connected. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Everything to me it means something. Mostly when it means nothing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they go into Piper, which I think is a fairly common pairing. Twist and Piper, I think, were played very frequently next to one another in early 3.0. I'd have to check those stats. There was barely any Piper to speak of. Like, they're done with the song by about two and a half minutes in. They switch very purposefully about three and a half minutes into a different key, and it's like, all right, we're done with Piper. Now we're just going to jam, even though Piper's the springboard for it. So and this I would be the definition it. of a fast Piper? This is, Everyone well, wants the slow buildup? I wouldn't say that, because there was no slow build. So yeah. this is just Piper. Just Piper. Just Piper. Uh, but it is actually, you mentioned it quite fast. About five and five and a half or five minutes and 15 seconds. I know people who complain a lot about 3.0. They play so slow. Listen back to this Piper. They are playing at like mega speed. talked about it earlier where like and you know i suggest going listen back to any show that you talk about on this podcast right because you then it might be something that you didn't see like they they were tight in most of the songs very like, much so like yeah. it, it was where it was rehearsed like that tuesday show they definitely rehearsed kill devil falls to play it again like <laughs> yeah like, right yeah. i hope to do this again or until you do it again yeah, maybe yeah. that's the thought thought process but so that it's it's because they they didn't play for so long they clearly want to just play songs yes they did well that's why the hampton shows were each set was like 90 minutes mm -hmm. they just kept playing music on those hampton sets where you thought all right this must be the closer and then there were five more songs so you imagine like trey when he's right like you know thinking back in 2009 the adhd of trey right when like well we have to play this one. Oh, but we also have to play this one. Oh, but we also have to play this one like now you, they mastered the set list and they'll play less songs because they've played for x amount of years since that he doesn't feel the need to play them all well something else that i loved about 2009 in that vein of like oh we got to play this one we got to play that one is they could have played anything they i think made a purposeful choice to play songs from their entire career it's not like when they get a new album out and they they play only those songs or they they focus exclusively on those you're likely is here to hear Buried Alive as you are to hear two brand new songs. Yeah, no, definitely. It's like a, you go to a fish show, you hear a cover, two really old songs, two songs you that are new that you know, and then maybe two songs that they wrote, Trey wrote on the bus on the way to yeah. the show, right? So that, that that's cool. Right, and for a lot of fans who were only around before this, uh, in 2.0 and late 1.0, that was not the case. There were some songs that were on the shelf. 
Yeah. And they were not getting pulled off the shelf. Looking at looking at the 1.0 set lists, it's like, oh man, I 1.0 set lists are so good. They play all the old songs. Like, yeah, because the only songs that existed. Right, like, they were new at some yeah, point. They, yeah, those were the only songs they had. After Piper, they would run into backwards down the number line. And I have my own thoughts about this particular performance of the song. I've definitely come around. But you could hear the end of Piper and Trey just starts up with those chords of backwards down the number line that kind of have nothing to do musically speaking with Piper or the jam they were even playing. And I thought to myself, was this the first rip chord that I ever heard in my 3.0 history? What were your thoughts on backwards down the number line since it was very new? So like at the time, like you, you knew it was a new song. You yeah. you saw a lot of people like, oh, like no one wanted to hear new fish. Like they yeah. wanted to hear old fish. It was a family reunion. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm glad that song's come a long way. Um, to quote a buddy of mine, there's people that like backwards down the number line and liars now, because I think that's pretty true. And then my, my thought process around is, you know, this version could definitely be better and it's why people hate this song. Like, okay. <laughs> but the thing about backwards down the number line, it's positive and what do you like? Don't like your friends and don't like your birthday and being happy. Like, like sure. Like that, that's why you don't like this song. And if that vocal round doesn't get stuck in your head, you're just not listening hard yes, enough yes. eventually, you know? And next was free, which was a good palate cleanser after backwards down the number line. I'm pretty sure they played it as a nod to the, again, it means something to the nod to the water, like splashing in the sea. Got a big cheer. Cause you know, at Jones beach, when you're down front, at a certain time of every night, there's high tide, and you better either not be wearing socks, you know, bring your Crocs to Jones Beach if you have orchestra seats. And definitely was also because of the rain. Most yeah. likely these people were knee deep. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. Like like on this this night in general. I think I started the show down there. I remember I was with my buddy Ted, and we had tickets down there, and we started there. And we're like, oh, everyone's up top, and we went up top. Yeah. You're probably the only person, person in the world that would I do, ever that know would that go from the orchestra. I would never do that now. Even yeah. I was like, oh, I can see my friends before and after the show. Now I'm a seat snob. <laughs> <laughs> Next up was the debut 20 years later, which I thought was very odd and very angular. At the time, I thought it kind of like sucked all the energy out of the room because, as you mentioned before, it is a very downbeat, depressing song. I don't think there, I don't think there's any shame in calling it that. You know, if um, Kill Devil Falls is kind of about the vibe of thinking you're going to get better, even though you're not really going to when it comes to addiction, right? Next time will be different until I do it again. 20 years later really focuses in on the troubles of when you're at your lowest point. Yeah. So that uh, that song is like funny now, like you, the way you explain that song now, like then, like that makes sense. And like it is like a, not a positive song at all, like in Song Joy. But just like some thought of it thing is... um. A lot of people are getting to there or have already passed there seeing fish for 20 years. So like yeah. if you're if you've been seeing fish for 20 years or about to get to a 20 your 20th anniversary show, you know, hopefully they play that song for you because you're still there. Yep. Yep. <laughs> still upside down. Yeah. And then there's an instant kick into a really fun dance party. Other than down with disease, my favorite part of the whole set was 2001. Really tight, really tight dynamics. Fishman is all over it. There's nothing really interesting, and if, if you're going for the jams, I'll say. nothing. But it's, if you want to play someone, like, if they say, what should I listen to to get into Fish, and you just need, like, a six-minute 2001 that's tight and punchy, you found it. Yeah, I think back to, uh, and, I, and I wrote down Pit of Wooks. This is another point. I looked into that elevator section of the upper mezzanine of Jones Beach. Next time they play Jones Beach, you got to show me this. It, we got to meet up. All the way up top in the middle, you'll see... A, at another store, the elevator, another show, the elevator door was open and it was raining and we like hung out in the elevator room. <laughs> um, there's, we'll talk about that off, off camera. Okay, fair uh, enough. Off, off microphone. But again, like looking in this like little spot, like they definitely can't see the show. It's definitely like spinners in, in like, oh, in rain. It's the pit of wooks, funky dance grooves. Um, as far as a show, a song that I would want Fish to play at every show, it's 2001. <laughs>
and before you know it, we're at the end of the set. They went really quickly, really quickly, and they close with the ultimate set two closer, just like Down with Disease Down. is the ultimate set two opener. They close with Slave to the Traffic Light. And things get very serious. It really sounds like something epic is about to happen about six minutes in, a little before that. And then it just returns kind of straight to the slave progression that we're all used to. I will say it reaches a great peak and it really does feel like a proper end to a good fish show. Like you you got it wrapped up at the restaurant, you're taking it home and now you have it forever. It really feels like well done. It is that classic closer, right? I think this is another song that they could play at every fish show and, and I would be happy about it. Yeah. Like I wouldn't feel cheated. Like, you know, when I think uh, kind of more recently, there's a couple times they've played it and then they play a song after it. And I'm like shocked. Like, like they'll close with character zero yeah, after Slave. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, like, like when they play Slave, I'm like, oh, that's it. That's the end of the show. So like, and I'm and I'm always okay with that. So like, I feel fulfilled. Um, and it's funny, like, I think like I could know like how many times I've seen that song. I like, would know the breakdown of the lights. Like you obviously know all the peaks of it. And uh, it's just a great song. Um, you know, the quintessential fish song to me is Slave. It's funny that you use the word fulfilled. I had the thought, and I wrote it down in our notes today, that this, it's the end of a three-night run, right? And this is the closing, it's not the encore, but it's the closing song of the of the show, basically, close enough, that I, I had the feeling that this is what people came for. Like, all fish fans that have missed them for so many years, or in your case, hadn't seen them before and mm-hmm. have wanted to, or ached to, the end of Slave to the Traffic Light is like, this is it. It's been anointed. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And you said it was like kind of the, the wrap-up of the show. It was the wrap-up of the first run that wasn't the Hampton run, which was a few months before. And then they go off for a little bit. We're trying to stay dry. They come back on for a Day of the Life encore. And I am thrilled that this has, if not any more recently, but at least for 3.0, has become possible. that Because there was a long time where they didn't play it. I remember when I got the first tapes of Halloween 95 and after the uh, Quadrophenia set, there was filler on it, including that, including that great Susie Greenberg. And A Day in the Life was there and I was just really becoming a serious Beatles fan, like other than their pop bubblegum stuff, like Twist and Shout, like I was really digging into their album work. And A Day in the Life, I thought, and still might say, is like their best song. There's an argument to be made. And the fact that Fish covered it sounded goofy, but then when I actually listened to it, it's like, holy shit, they could do this impossible song justice. Yeah, well, I think it goes back to, especially like the end of that song where it's organized or chaos. Yeah. So what'd you say? What'd yeah, you, organized what, chaos. Yeah, organized chaos. Like that's what day in life has. Um, you know, everyone's gone through their Beatles phase. Um, I, I think you talk to some people like, oh, I don't really like the Beatles. Like they just sound like everything else. No, because they sounded like nothing else. Right. Like, everyone right. else everyone sounds, sounds like them. Like, them. like yeah. and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to see them fish play this song a few times. And it's um, a thrill. Like we talked about my friend, my friend, yeah. where that never gets all that kind of big ascension. It, yeah. It's got its parallel here. People are definitely excited for hearing it. You know, it's a great song. Everybody knows this song. Yeah. You know, like if you're a fish fan or not, you you know this song. It's something that's that's out there. So it was a cool one to hear. Again, a great rap on the bow of hey, we're fish, we're back. This is uh this is the start of summer tour. So Joseph, thanks again for being here to talk about or being here. We're here together. Yeah. Finally get to say that. To talk about June 5th, 2009, Fish at Jones Beach, the last show of their Jones Beach run that year. And they have played several years since. I hope they come back and I hope I get seats not in the mezzanine. But anyway, it's been a true pleasure. Let's just remind anyone listening about your Instagram account and what they can expect to see and hear on there. Sure. Uh, it's uh, at Taste of Your Creation, uh, Instagram and Facebook. It mainly, you'll see videos of me eating, but more importantly, <laughs> things that my wife cooks. And also commentary. Yeah, commentary and things. Uh, we're always taking suggestions. So when you're on tour, if you're at a place and you want to know what to eat, Send us a message. We get a lot of people sending us recommendations. And I also want to know when I go to cities, like, what should I eat? Um, gotten meet, met cool people that way. So enjoy that. But Brian, thanks for having me. This was a, a good chat and keep doing what you're doing. My absolute pleasure. Thanks again, Jeff. And that's it for today's conversation with Joseph from Taste of Your Creation about June 5th, 2009 at Jones Beach. But we can't leave today without doing a quick attendance bias fact check. 
Attendance Bias Fact Check. That two-night run at the Gorge when I camped next to the professional chefs was on July 15th and 16th of 2016. Guys, if you're out there and remember cooking paella with elephant ear garlic and sockeye salmon sandwiches, please reach out. I would love nothing more than to touch base with you. When talking about catching songs that you didn't know you were chasing, I mentioned that on December 30th, 2018, Fish played Mike's song into Glide 2, and I never, ever expected to hear that song. I was right about the date of that bust out, which was the first time in 872 shows that Fish played Glide 2. When recalling these three nights at Jones Beach, Fish played on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Neither Joseph nor I could remember why they would skip the Wednesday night, and he suggested to me that I check the Jones Beach schedule from that year. So I did check the 2009 Jones Beach summer lineup on jonesbeach.com, and no one played that Wednesday the 3rd, so it'll remain a mystery. Quick fact check on me. I said that I've always loved Wilson as a show opener because it reminds me of a live one, and I get to pretend that I'm part of that crowd on disc one of the album. But something didn't sound quite right to me even after I said it, so I checked again and Wilson opened disc two of a live one. So I guess I'll have to make believe I'm part of that crowd instead. Discussing Fish's tease of Oye Como Va by Santana during Twist, Joseph and I discussed a little bit about when Fish opened for Santana at Jones Beach. That date was July 24th, 1992. Fish's set lasted about 45 minutes, but later on the band came on stage and joined Santana's band for his full set later that evening. And that's it for today's episode of Attendance Bias. Again, I'd like to thank Joseph of Taste of Your Creation for joining me today. I'd like to thank Fish.net for all of the information we needed for the fact check and Fish.in for the recording used in today's episode. If you enjoy Attendance Bias, please support the show by leaving a rating and a review of it on your favorite podcast app. Also, always feel free to reach out to me on social media. I'm most active on Instagram and Twitter. Reach out and say hello, and I'm happy to send you a free sticker. Thank you again always for listening, and I'll see you next week on Attendance Bias. Attendance Bias.